So, let me tell you something that you should have already realized by now about this fucking show you're listening to. This shit is supposed to be for mature audiences. As in grown-ups, mentally mature. It's supposed to talk about adult subjects, an adult frame of mind. It's not fucking that at all. This is two emotionally regressed, broken half-wits pretending to offer insight on movies. All they really offer you is an endless sexual perversion and a laundry list of personal paraphilia issues. You can make your own choices in life, but you have to choose this as entertainment. You know you're better than this. You have to know you are better than listening to Cinema Psyops. episode of Cinema PsyOps, the only podcast where the episode 336 ends up making it to where the first two numbers being added together becomes the third. Huh? Three? Three? Six? Huh? Huh? By the way, I'm your host, Court, and someone who is really pissed off at me because he's promised there would be no math is my co-host, Matt. Let's see. Carry that by three. Three plus three is six, dude. Hold on. I'll get it. I'll get it. I'm just working this out. Uh, (laughs) Nine. (laughs) Got it. (laughs) <laughs> three plus what? three is six plus six is 12 so so now your numerology is all fucked okay i'm you're right you're right sorry i carried the wrong one it is uh exactly uh 162 <laughs> e- no <laughs> X equals Y. I don't know what the fuck we're doing around here. Will you help me out? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so we're the only podcast where the first two numbers add up to equal the third. Three plus three equals six. That was my stupid saying because I've got got Uh, nothing else. I'm tapped the fuck out. You tapped out? You had a big show last night. 
Oh, so that's what we're going to do. Yeah, I'm yeah, tapped yeah. out. I'm, well, if you're tapped out a funny end and don't go shit, we'll just talk about life. Yeah, that works for me. Yeah, the wife bought tickets back before Omicron was a thing. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. we went to see the Dead South. However, the venue followed the mask mandate stuff that's in place because Omaha has a mask mandate now because of Omicron. Yes. Uh, my wife and I are both vaccinated, boosted. The like part of the rider for the band for the Dead South was everyone had to be vaccinated and show a card or photo ID of the card like you know like with photo ID yeah. to prove that that's you or, oh, you yeah, had, exactly. or or you had to have a test that showed that you were negative before you could enter that was like it's, that it's, same day I think yeah it's real lucky that you don't enjoy forms of entertainment that could be done by people who are right leaning and be like fuck mass and all that shit like you like a group is that's probably going to be like yeah no we want vaccinated people there they, they got to be vaccinated wear masks all that kind of shit well okay so the dead south of the band are Canadian yeah. So okay. I, I would assume that they are more hopefully better educated they're, than Americans. They're, so not there are nutty Canadians too, but I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm right. Right. You're not wrong. It's but. almost a safe bet that if you're going, you and your wife are going to a show and it's your wife who bought the tickets, the band is fairly, fairly going to be at least reasonable in, in, in looking the science and, and realize, Hey, vaccines and mass work. <laughs> yeah. But you're more than likely going to meet a Canadian that is um, more well-educated, more taken care of and much healthier and happier than any single American who makes under a hundred thousand dollars a year. They probably would have gotten your math joke. So uh, <laughs> I, I didn't get it. And now I'm going to take that as disrespect. I'm going to be passive aggressive for the rest of the fucking show. <laughs> because if you truly become tr- kind of aggressive at me, you know, <laughs> bad things can happen. Bad, bad things. Yeah. I, it's going to be passive aggressive Well, because that's all the Republicans do when you like do something that they think is, you know, whenever you say something scientific and uh, they don't want to like read or something. They don't actually get violent, violent to your face. They just get passive aggressive and then just start saying things like, I, I, I don't fucking even know. <laughs> <laughs> You've ridden them from your life enough to where you don't have to worry about that. That's cool. Pretty much. Yeah. I've hidden a, a lot of assholes so that I've lost a lot of that shit. So like, <laughs> they'll tell you something else like, Oh really? You think mass works? I bet you don't think people live on Mars. That, that's something they believe uh, <laughs> that Nazis live on Mars. I'm sorry. Not no. Nazis. No, they're very clearly on the moon. Otherwise, that movie Iron Sky was lying to me. No, 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 that's true. And then there are more people living under the earth than on top of it, by the way. Also that. Well, if so. the Godzilla series that was done recently by Legendary Pictures is to be believed, there is like a pocket dimension on the inside of the earth that is open and giant and vast and ruled by monsters. I know. That's where I hide my porn. Duh. Who has Jeez. porn anymore? I, I don't even know. It's just suddenly a good thing to say at this point. <laughs> <laughs> How was the show though? So get get to the show part. <laughs> oh yeah, well the show was incredible. Uh, the Rainbow Excellent. Girls, the Rainbow Girls was the opening act, and uh, they were witty and charming and funny. And one of them, I swear to God, I thought looked exactly like Lorraine Newman, like at her very first year in SNL. Oh nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And okay. I, and I was like, I was like, that's, hol- that's such a random person to look like too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like like hair perfectly, like had yeah. the baseball cap like Lorraine would wear sometimes when like she was doing like you know segments where she was supposed to be a cast member or whatever you know to look a little more yeah. key because they always threw a ball cap on them for that yeah and, and just like you know dressed relatively similar to how Lorraine Newman would dress so it like I, I just was really bizarre because I'm like I, I, yeah, I felt like this was just something that only I could see and I pointed it out to my wife who immediately was like Lorraine Newman and I like told her like SNL and I got her to picture her in her head and then she saw it too so but uh they they were more like stand-up comedians who also played music and were amazing harmony Harmonizers, so it was a bluegrass show. So this is not for everybody. And it yeah. was, it was. I'm not gonna lie, it was too fucking mellow for me. Like I oh, was, was it? yeah, I was sitting there, and I'm like, everybody else is probably like super relaxed and having a great time. Yeah, and I'm just sitting there like, fuck, fuck, inside, <laughs> like trying to hold it together while I'm like, you know, everybody else is like hoe down and having a good old time, and here's me inside, fuck, fuck, You're like we're the fucking mosh pit, man. Well. No, that's just how I'm, that's my brain. That's how my brain is oh, yeah. fucking wired. I'm just fucking intense all the time and I can't fucking help it. I'm trying to turn it down. <laughs> yeah. Do you, uh, you need to, you need to get something on there. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, <laughs> I need to do some crack about it, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know if doing crack, but I don't think crack's going to help your internalized rage. I just, it might be the wrong drug. <laughs> yeah, well, my default setting, you know, let's let's yeah, let's, yeah. let's crank this bitch up to 11 for Nigel it's... Tuffington and see what happens. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, but for me, it was it was definitely it was too mellow of a show. But like the musicianship was incredible. All of the yeah. all of the harmonizations. And that's really if you you're going to listen to bluegrass you definitely want to listen to bluegrass specifically for the harmonizations because that's what is really some of the best work um, yeah and obviously the dead south has a little bit more of a uh darker twinge to some of their songs and that show actually inspired me so we're going to bring it all the way back around to the actual show now matt see how hey, i did that right. i'm kind of back on my game a little bit you kind of helped me <laughs> get out of that funk there we go professional uh, <laughs> so for the french sex murders film that we are covering on the show uh, for the pirate radio edit the theme I decided to go for was just murder ballads basically oh, there you go. songs that are love songs but are basically love songs are about basically you try to leave me I'll kill you or he killed her because or she killed him because but since there is giallo on the show because it is giallo January still it is the murder ballots are going to lean more towards the male killing the female because let's face it that's what most murder is about in real life and definitely in giallo so for the last movie we did, but yeah. <laughs> That's fair. There are plenty of female murderers as well, but this week Don't we... be sexist. Females right. can murder too. The victims are primarily female, as we will definitely see, and uh, they're going to be involving prostitution in this, so it's it ticks all the boxes, absolutely. But yeah, I just wanted to kind of state that for this film specifically, the murder ballads are leaning more towards men killing women out of jealousy, because that was the main idea that they think is what happens at the start of the film, and how that turns out, we won't necessarily get there, but that's where I'm going with the pirate radio edit. You dig? I do. Can we just move on and do the show we, now? We can, can move can, the can, fuck on. We let's should probably, go. yeah. Jesus fucking yeah. Christ. What the fuck is wrong with us? We've done enough pablum. All right, let's move on. This will keep you quiet. <laughs> oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You call me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. <laughs> I said quiet. <laughs> My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com, or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now... Back to the cutting room. Shit, that song sounds so fucking dark if you have seen the French sex murders. That's very true. <laughs> like when I picked That's... it, I literally picked it because I knew it was like threatening somebody's life for cheating. You yeah. Know? And that like you better run for your life. But like listening to it, it fits the movie so fucking well. And I can't wait to tell the people how. Right. And there's no fucking yeah. trailer. So we might as well. Might as well. Well, let's fucking do it. So the French sex murders. All right. We start with uh, the first 20 minutes starts with uh, we see. um 
Uh, dude, like, fall off what looks like the Eiffel Tower. Uh, cops are all around him. And then we hear a narration from the dude says, It all happened the last night of Carnival. We see a dude, he's stealing some shit, jewelry and such. That same dude's walking outside a house of ill repute, you might say. Uh, it's a brothel. These... It, there's it's no ill brothel. repute. It's a well-known brothel, and they're like licensed just a way of and saying shit. It. Just a way of saying it. Everyone just settle it down, all right? <laughs> it's the no place way. where people go in hoods to sin real fucking good. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, so good. <laughs> mm. Looks like the kind of hip place that I could have gotten into when I was a single man. Yeah, it's a lot of that's a lot of sinning. Um. So, anywho, um, uh, then also comes in all these hooded figures walk in as well. No one, the thief is in there. No one wants him there. They tell him he shouldn't even be there. Um. Then we cut to some tarot card reading. Um. And this guy who's sitting there with like the madam, they're doing tarot card reading. He's gonna go on a fascinating journey. Uh. Then um, one of the other girls who looks in and says the big men are in town, so you might want to you know get it going. And everyone's like, oh. Let's get everyone going. Well, the madam meets with the thief. His name's Antoine. And he says he'll pay twice as much for a night with Francine, even though the madam doesn't want him there. She says, fine, but this is his last time. And for Francine to hurry up because the hooded figure, big people, campus, town folk, uh, they, they, they really want Francine in the room as well. Um, Antoine, he, uh, goes up there upstairs, cut to Antoine and Francine in bed. He gives her all the jewelry he took. Uh, he says that, you know, it's fine, she can have it, but, uh, he says that, uh, if she takes it, then she is only his. Um, I may be wrong, but a, uh, sex worker is probably the last person you should expect that kind of exclusive vividity from. <laughs> Uh, there is something in this display that makes it feel like that gentleman is not necessarily in touch with reality. He definitely is not in touch with reality. And has an expectation of what should be happening. And I believe that while a more experienced veteran in the sex work industry would recognize someone who is expecting more than they're willing to offer as part of the trade mm -hmm. and would kind of help wean that client off and or move them along for their own safety and health. Yeah. But this particular sex worker, I believe, may be of a more inexperienced variety and has been stringing this guy along because she likes them jewels. She and likes you, that money yeah, and she's you, letting him believe what he wants to believe. And you'd think the madam probably shouldn't have said yes to this guy, but he paid double, so she took it, so... Well, right, which is um, kind of messed up. You, may, you know, if you know someone appears to be that kind of a danger, uh, the man clearly has a history of beating this girl whenever she disappoints him, and that's yeah. why he was forbidden to be there. And yet they let him back in because he gives even more money, and then what's about to happen happens. Yeah. So anyway, then we cut back to uh, the group, and there's a guy. He's writing a book. This guy who's uh, with the madam. He's writing a book about like prostitution, and he's like my American writer reader will eat this up. Did you apparently, uh, apparently catch American the writer's women, name? Uh, no. The writer's name is Randall, which is a tribute to the producer of the film, Dick Randall, who is apparently an entrepreneur of sleaze and someone I should probably look at in their other film career. Yeah, you probably really should. So Randall, the writer, he's like, why don't you want him here? And she's like, well, he's actually starting to fall in love with Francine, is what Madam said. Well, we cut to Francine and the dude are bony. Um, then the writer, he's talking to some of the ladies and, hey, that's our first clip the research in my book is going to give the reading public the real insight i'll have a shot at that can't miss i tell you in the states the women are really fascinated on the subject of prostitution they'll sneak the book home and madame colette will become famous you're lucky i let you gather material here madame colette who are the clients in the mask costumes <laughs> i can't tell you in this profession, you don't tell those things. Oh, I see. How about calling Francine? I've got a couple of minutes to spare. Well, the group does call Francine down and tell her to come down. And so as she's starting to get up, Antoine flips out uh, because she's leaving and starts beating her. That's pretty hard to watch. Uh, the writer's kind of walking around downstairs. He sees Antoine leaving and Antoine's looking all shifty while doing it. While Antoine's leaving, he runs into a police officer and runs away from him. The writer comes out holding some bloody jewelry. And he tells the madam that Francine's dead. They quickly empty out the clients, the hooded clients, you know, 
because they're important. Uh, the cops get there to investigate the crime scene, and that's our next clip. That's exactly the way we found her. Mister, get her off to the morgue. Yes, sir. The last person with her was Antoine Gadvalis. You sure, Mr. Randall? I am. Seems cut and dried. Mistral. Yes, sir. I want you to check this address. He got Valleys. He was the girl's last customer? Yes. He was the last. No one was here. No one but us. Where were the others? Kiki and Alice. Both were preparing the sauna room. We have people that come at night and pay overtime for a sauna and a mas massage. Massage? Oh, of course, a massage. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Randall, where do you figure in this operation? What else do you have to know? It was that maniac Antoine Gathales. He threatened her life before. <laughs> that poor girl. If only I'd kept him out. Mestral. Mestral. I got that information. Get out an all-points bullet and to bring in a suspected Antoine got valleys. He could be dangerous. Right, Chief. He's wanted for suspicion or murder. All right, so how much did that fucking guy look like Humphrey Bogart? Thanks, French Humphrey Bogart, right? <laughs> Well, no, this is an Italian-made film. It's oh, just Italian-made. Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. He's, he's an Italian actor. I think is Robert Saki. I think or oh, Sachi man. or something I like mean, that. Yeah, yeah. He was he was a dead ringer. Well, and yeah. they very clearly dressed him up like Bogart just to go, you know, like in Casablanca, just to kind of like push that even further, where he's wearing the trench coat and everything. And yeah. uh, he played Humphrey Bogart like in a ton of fucking TV and stuff like that. But this is the first entry I could find, like the first acting that he did, and I think he got hired specifically because. He's a Bogart lookalike to be in the film, and they wanted to have Bogart investigating sex crime murders. I, I yeah, I guess. Jesus Christ, <laughs> <laughs> like sexualized murder. Like this is such a weird fucking movie already. We're not even the full twenty minutes in. We're like barely five fucking minutes in. We've had like a brutal beating, and then a woman that's supposedly been murdered, and then we're guessing that it's this guy, and then all of a sudden this weird fucking Humphrey Bogart looking motherfucker comes walking in, like so. So much so that you think they may have actually stolen footage of Humphrey Bogart and somehow put it in the film. Yeah. Yeah, it was getting to that point. <laughs> and then once you realize, no, that's just an Italian actor that looks a lot like Humphrey Bogart, you're like, fuck, I missed all that fucking dialogue and you have to go back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, what the fuck is going on around here? This film at this point had me so far fucking off balance, Matt, I almost gave up and said, fuck it, I'll watch it tomorrow. Yeah, right? <laughs> Like, I'll watch this later. Fuck this shit. <laughs> right, I was just like, what the fuck is going on? But once I settled in and got used to the idea that, yes, this guy's going to look like Bogart. No, no one's going to call any attention to it. I just have to accept that. And then, yeah, that brutality won't really get that horrible again. It'll yeah, be no. different. <laughs> <laughs> at least so once once i realized that was happening like then i settled in and started enjoying the film but like this was a really off-putting moment yes it was um we cut in another couple they are trying to hook up and antoine starts showing up at their door he wants the lady's help we find out that's his ex-wife but she says no you only come here when you're in trouble antoine gets really pissed and the guy pushes him out from the door they close and then they close the door and locks in on anton who starts yelling that he'll kill him and yelling that the, he'll beat him. But then he hears silence and he tries to run away. But eventually a person asks if he wants a cigarette. He says, yes, that person lights him up. It's Humphrey Brogart cop. And he chains him or he handcuffs him to a railing. And that ends the first 20 minutes. So Bogey's all smooth and is like, look, Sean, this doesn't matter a hill of beans what happens between the two of us. But you want a cigarette? <laughs> there you go. Have yourself a smoke, kid. Play the kin, Sam. Maybe you feel a little bit better about yourself after you have a cigarette. <laughs> of course I tricked you, you dumb son of a bitch. I'm a cop. You can't trust me. <laughs> I can't do well Bogart. Done. I don't even, I don't even, yeah. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't even know, but yeah, I, I, I couldn't do a Bogart either. So good job because I, I, I mean, I can't do any better. I am basing uh, my Bogart on what I saw in Looney Tunes as a kid. So I, I have no frame of reference. I'm doing a character of a character. <laughs> Yeah, you're doing, uh, I thought you are going to add in the say, say, and I'm like, I don't think that's Bogart. <laughs> that's, uh, that's somebody else. 
Meh. Yeah, nah, no, no, that's Edward G. Robertson. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I think. I don't, hey, say. Fuck if I know. But like, okay, we, we got to get over the fact that Humphrey Bogart's in this film, but we can't. Yeah. Because it's not Humphrey Bogart. It's, it's our. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like it's, if we ever cover those movies of that dude that looks like Charles Bronson the entire time, we're going to be like, this just, no, it just, yeah. it's not Bronson. It just doesn't feel right. <laughs> yeah. This, this guy looks like, uh, yeah, Charles Bronson, but he's not Charles Bronson. <laughs> My sister's the same, but she's not the same. There's a uh, Roseanne reference for somebody out there that might have got that one person yeah, there you go. got that and whoever that is i'd like to hear from you <laughs> oh well we start the next 20 minutes with uh the coroner and the judge they're meeting and they're talking about the case the coroner states it should really be a brief trial for the judge uh and then they were talking about you know even the press probably won't have much and might be the most trouble you have and the judge makes mention how he hates the press they have too much freedom and i'm like there's our republican we found him that's nice that's nice Hasn't changed much, has it, in all these years? This was made Uh, in 1972, and I wonder if it's reflecting the 70s attitude in America from the producer Dick Randall or the Italian sentiment towards the press in the 70s. I'm I'm sure it's to, you know, put your hands together. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, clearly this is a right-wing motivated fucking giallo, right? Yeah, 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 because, I mean... The, the Republican Party, not much has changed in all the years that it's been around. <laughs> or is this suppressed. a bunch of lefties making a fucking observation about judges that is true to this day still? Uh, it could be. Yeah, it could be. Either way, that's how Republicans act. Then, now, forever. The type of person that that particular political leaning appeals to, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, the coroner, uh, he has a new assistant, and his assistant shows up, and then he kind of, like, night's over. The doc needs to grab some notes and shit like that um so then uh the assistant he uh goes to leave and the daughter uh the coroner's daughter's there and she's gonna walk him out as she's walking him out they start making out uh apparently they are in a thing but she stops him like you know i want to but we can't right now my father's here and he's apparently he's not very cool with his daughter dating anyone not even just the coroner so um, that's weird but uh we'll get back to that later um (laughs) yes let's just put that very creepy very yeah. fucking sexually controlling your own daughter shit aside in a giallo and not pay attention to it. Yeah, yeah. Let's. Uh, I mean, I'm sure it's fine. Everything's fine. I don't know why everyone's getting no uppity about this. It's, yeah, in a it's, normal it's functioning society, that type of behavior for a man towards his own daughter is not in any way, shape, or form a warning sign or creepy as fuck. No, it's, it's normal stuff. Might as well just have her give you a, a purity ring or some shit like that. Or be Ugh. like that fucking cringy rapper dude that paid a fucking doctor to check his daughter for him oh god jesus yeah i forgot oh my just fuck whoever men that asshole's fucking, name is better better fucking weird all right and it's just yeah anyway let's just move on <laughs> so um the madam and the group they are hanging out with the ex-wife of antoine and her new boyfriend in witness room and that is our next see clip him dead poor francine I don't know. I still have my doubts. After all, he was my husband. And he did have a terrible temper. But a murderer? I don't believe it's possible. In my mind, there's no doubt about it. He did it. Dr. Duluc, do you remember me? Why, yes. You're Mr. Randall. We met at the inquest last month. Uh Uh-huh, right. You talked with the professor, Waldemar. Yes, certainly. But his time is too precious, you see. I would like to talk to you if you don't mind. Very well, but another time. I have to get back to the lab. Let's meet later and have a drink. Fine, okay with me. Come to my place. I think we all need a drink after this ordeal. And you can all hear Marianne's latest song there. You can come to my house later. We'll have a party. The police have closed it for a while. But Mr. Randall is always welcome there. Antoine Godfales, you've been tried and judged by your peers. For the murder of Francine Boulaire, the court has found you guilty. No. No, I didn't kill her. Are you mad? Silence from the prisoner. I repeat. I'm not guilty. For the charge of murder of Francine Boulaire, guilty. The court condemns you to death. By the guillotine. You'll find out I'm not guilty. Silence. No, I'm not the murderer. You won't believe I didn't commit it. 
My friends all watching, happy to see me die for something I didn't do. It was one of you out there. One of you killed her. You're happy to let me pay for your crime. There's no justice in this world. And if there's a second world, I promise you all something. From the grave, I'll come back. And I promise to repay all of you. Makes good reading. Antoine Gottwallis promises to return from the grave. <laughs> this sells newspapers. All who condemned him will die violently by his curse. George, you're on the list. Doesn't it worry you? If I paid attention to everyone's threats, why, I'd be in the loony bin now. <laughs> well, so we get a last, you know, spinning fucking death warning. Whatever. So anyway, the writer and uh, lady are talking, and they said they'll see each other later on that night. Uh, the writer then hears a radio message saying that Antoine has escaped on a transport to death row. We see Antoine run around town. He steals a motorbike. Uh, the cops uh, are kind of working on everything. They find out he got a motorbike and where he's running to and that he's running around. Uh, they give chase. Uh, there's a chase scene here and uh, he's on the bike and he accidentally runs into a truck and uh, he gets decapitated. The number of decapitations that happen in this giallo I found quite pleasant and I have to say that this decapitation made me relax. Really? Finally. Yeah, yeah it You're was at fine. this it was at this point where I'm like, okay, yeah, I can deal with the Bogart thing. The decapitation was cool. Yeah. I got to watch this guy who beat the shit out of a fucking beautiful woman <laughs> get his head fucking lopped off from his own stupidity. Yeah. Um, good job. <laughs> yeah. And as far as I know, he's the fucking murderer, so I'm like, you know, crime's over, right? So now what's gonna happen? Yeah. I mean, even if he wasn't the murderer, he still beat women, so there you go. Right. I know for sure that I watched him hit a woman more than enough, which is once. Yes. And uh, now his head's off, and we can all be happy about yeah, that. Yeah, I can relish the fact that a man who beats women is yeah. now decapitated. I, I can I can take joy in that. Yeah. But I'll, also, part of me and realizes... There was, and there was much rejoicing. Yay! Yay! Uh, but I, the thing that I really liked about this is this becomes a quick change in the story where we assumed he was the murderer and then maybe he would get out or something, you know, what was going to happen because he was caught, he was on trial, all of that kind of stuff. And they even have like the rogues gallery behind him. Like, mm -hmm. this is an old school giallo. I haven't seen this since we covered uh, Eyeball, aka the secret killer, I think is what it's called, or Labyrinth of Terror, where yeah. uh, the killer that was wearing the red slicker and was always taking the eyeball ball out of the victim oh uh, yeah 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 yeah. you remember there's a scene on the bus where like they show them on that like and it's like this any one of these people could be the suspects you know yes and uh we we got that in pieces as well well they're all lined up like actually like yeah just all all together and we got that specifically here you know <laughs> where there's a rogues gallery behind him because he even says one of you must be the killer and they like specifically take that Cr agatha christie moment <laughs> of yeah, zooming right? in on everybody while he's saying it and then they just totally lop off his fucking head. And now we're like, wait, so maybe somebody else was the killer? Because, like, that would be movie over, right? This is this is, this is is how they fucking ended Deep Red, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, all right, it's all over, everyone. Go home. What the fuck are I mean, I mean fine. Yeah, I mean, I killer... I to do anyway today, but... Killer decapitated Giallo over is a very good sign to you. Yeah, I mean, all right, well, listen, uh, show's over, guys. So we'll talk to everyone later. Have a good night. Right, but we checked the running time and realized, oh, wait, so he uh, must not have been the killer right like because he's already dead yeah. that's made him above suspicion at this point because we've got like half a fucking movie left and, and he can't even say like oh maybe like he faked his death it's it's kind of hard to fake decapitation so <laughs> lord knows i've tried lord knows i have uh so Anywho, so then we cut to his ex. She's singing in a club. Uh, the ex's kind of dude boyfriend is hanging out at the club, and uh, he's watching this other lady, and this guy's kind of really drunk and getting handsy, getting real fucking forceful with the lady, who is not appreciative of it. She does not want this happening. Um, all the while, the lady's singing, she's kind of seeing this happen, you know, and... and the 
guy gets up and says, yeah, you've just had too much to drink. He kind of manhandles the guy a little bit and then says, get him out of here. And, but no markings on him because, you know, he'll spend money again. But the guy, he's like, yeah, you're drunk and that's why you're doing this instead of, you know, you should just be throwing him out of the fucking place. But whatever. His lady, she ain't too happy about this because she thinks that, like, shit's going on between him and that girl. Anyway, the detective shows up and he kind of talks to the two, especially the ex-wife. And he's like, I'm not solid that Antoine was the actual murderer. Uh, he goes, it's still some things I want to check out. And the ex-wife's like, I, you know, she has that feeling like I don't believe he was a murderer and, uh, or, you know, whatever shit she wants to say. Cut to the, uh, doctor is talking to the, the coroner. He's talking to the judge. He wants Anton's head, uh, to be able to study from it. And the judge even allows him to have it. He's like, yeah, sure. What the fuck? Uh, go ahead. Take it. Uh, get the fuck out of here. And that's completely a normal request to ask for the head of a recently deceased perpetuator of fucking crime. (laughs) Yeah, 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 right? Yeah, and he said he wants it for tests and stuff. And as they're checking the head, the assistant keeps saying that the eyes are moving and watching him. Oh, jeez, okay. Uh, Then the assistant and the doctor's daughter, they uh, really want to tell her dad about their relationship. Uh, But she needs more time and wants to wait on it. And that ends that 20 minutes. What was with that fucking eyes still moving thing? Yeah, never really goes back into anything. Yeah, they try to, like, point to it to be something. I think it was just them trying to be extra creepy and weird. Like a red herring. Like, oh, this could be mystical. This might be a mystical horror movie. It reminds me in that Rest in Pieces where the the fucking uh, ant's body just sits up on its own and they explain it away with some kind of bullshit techno babble. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. pent up gases and, like, swamp. Yeah, all that shit. Like, some shit. fake yeah. science shit. Pseudo-science. <laughs> right, it felt like the Giallo was doing that for a minute. And in my head, I'm like, oh, they're not going to do that last image captured on the back of the eye bullshit in this, are they? Because I know there's a giallo that they do that in, at least one or two of them, you know. But then, no, the guy just has this weird fucking eyeball fetish or some shit. Yeah, seems that way. Exactly. And you're just like, ah, great. That's all this is. All right. Well, then never mind. (laughs) Right. But (laughs) But, uh, giallo (laughs) movies with a predilection for the mutilation of eyes, the removal of eyes, or some kind of sexual gratification involving eyes is apparently a thing. Is that like a lot of just like, uh, that just be like a lot of Italian shit? I think eye trauma, just because it's so fucking horrific, is just horror. And that's a shortcut. But yeah, it's primarily an Italian horror. Like they go right to the eyes for a lot of stuff. But, like, especially in Jallos, like, killers who collect eyes or do something weird with eyes, like, we've seen it twice already in just this Giallo January, so I'm going to say it, Matt. It's a thing. It is a thing. As far as Giallos are concerned. It's a thing. Yeah, Yeah, and... It's definitely a thing. Eye trauma, definitely for Fulci. It's a thing. Yeah, in a lot of Italian cinema, disproportionately to the rest of the world, as far as I can tell in my viewing. It's a thing. Yeah. Definitely a thing. Definitely a thing. Um... Yes, a big time thing. Uh, the next twenty starts with uh, the writer. Uh, the writer is with the madam, and he's uh, st- reading his story. And that's our next clip. And in the full fury of Antoine's passion, he struck the lovely Francine with an alabaster lamp. They say it was an accident when his head was severed, but it was a higher court that judged him, a mighty power that judges us all. And the house of Madame Colette is shuttered by the police. Is Madame Colette's house of love a thing of the past? You write well, Randall. But you've also reminded me I have to get back in business. What are you going to do? I'm going to speak to Inspector Fontaine. Fontaine. Yeah. Yeah, I got the message from your man, Saint Andre. I'm afraid there's nothing we can do about your situation. Tessier, I wouldn't talk to him about this at all if I were you. Okay, bye. Madame Colette, what's her problem? I just like the idea of having a massage parlor. Of course not. She's a fucking madam. That's how she makes money. Exactly. 
<laughs> that isn't really what they were discussing, so we know that Bogey's playing his cards close to the vest on this one. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a lot of other things that he's uh, he's looking at here. I do, um, I do have to say that once we settle in with Bogey, the way that they're playing this guy to beat Bogey and also as a detective that's yeah. investigating this, like, you kind of get into it, but you have to do it in sort of a tongue-in-cheek way because you can't take it serious. No, no, you can't. It's fucking you gotta, impossible. You gotta just have fun with this, and yeah. that's all. Yeah, <laughs> like, the entire time the guy's on screen looking like and, like, really trying to pose like Bogart and, like, sometimes yeah. holding a cigarette in his mouth just like Bogart, you can't fucking take the movie seriously while this guy's on screen. Like, it's yeah. fucking impossible. But when he's not on screen, you absolutely can. So I think he's almost, like, comedic relief, but at the same time, he's a really good fucking detective. And they're playing it so straight, which is what makes it even more hilarious to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really good stuff. I, I love it. <laughs> it's fucking weird. And, like, I it do. I, like, I shouldn't find it as charming as I do, but it fucking won me over by this point. Like, I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> I'm so fucking in. I'm like, this is so fucking weird. I thought I was having a flashback. I'm like, am I... Am I- Watching Casablanca? What the fuck are we doing over here? <laughs> Did somebody mix up the fucking computing to scan the films? What the fuck, man? Motherfucker. Uh, so, um, then we see one of the ladies. She's kind of scared being in the house. Uh, we see the madam. She's getting ready for bed that night. But someone is lurking about. The madam hears something. She grabs a gun she has in her night table. As she goes to check it out, we see a person attacks the madam. And, uh, and so someone attacks her before she could get a shot off. This automatically cuts the detective interviewing uh, a regular uh, who would go to the madams all the time, and she was indeed murdered. Um, the detective and the writer then talk, and that's our next clip. I've asked you here, Randall, so that maybe you could shed some light on the latest killing. It appears that the conviction of God Wallace was a little premature. Madam Colette's murder has proven that. I want you to dig in that factual mind of yours, recall every detail during the time you spent in Madame Colette's house. I told you everything the last time. I've checked all my notes. In my opinion, the motive was money. A rather brutal way of stealing. What did you know about her money? Everyone in that house knew about her eccentricity. She allegedly had large amounts of money. She didn't trust banks. Besides your curiosity, anyone else interested in enough to remark about it? Come to think of it, yes, there was. One of the girls, Alice, seemed to have a special interest. But she left the house and no one knows what happened to her. Maybe she has financing for some traveling. Could be as much as a million francs. Get on this. Check with the Pigal informers. And bring Alice in. All right, Chief. Randall, I've never been completely convinced that a writer must live among whores just for a story. Or weren't there other motives? I don't care what you think. Do you want to arrest me for that? Get out. Ooh, Bogey's had enough. Yeah, he wasn't happy about that guy. Um, then we cut to uh, the judge and the coroner. They're playing ch- uh, chess and they're talking. And they're talking about reopening. Uh, the judge is talking about going through the investigation of Antoine. Uh, obviously, they, they all know now that Antoine's murderer ain't around. So or Antoine wasn't the murderer. He... he you know, so they're having to find. He's going to go through all the documents. And that actually makes the assistant look somewhat not happy. Uh, very disturbed looking, the assistant was. Well, then the judge has a dizzy spell. And the, uh, the, uh, the you know, he feels better. But the coroner has the assistant take him home. Uh, when they get back to his place, the assistant was very interested in the judge's home. Well, anyway, uh, the doctor, he's checking out an eyeball. And uh, then he, uh, later Later on, he's talking to his daughter, and he's like, you know, I just want to make sure, you know, my assistant and no one else is bothering you. I don't want you to be bothered. And she's like, yeah, no one's bothering me. He goes, all right, I just notice the assistant's around a lot. He goes, I don't want him bothering you. And she's like, no, no, he's not. And he's like, oh, yeah, all right. Can we just decode some shit here real quick? Yeah. All right, first of all, the eyeball stuff was super gross when he was carving yeah. it up. It was an actual eyeball that they were kind of dissecting and making jelly shoot out of, and was pretty, really disgusting, actually, to, to watch. Yeah. Uh, it was, we, not, it was yeah. not adorable. No, it was not 
not fun to watch him tinker around with that thing. <laughs> and we're definitely doing it for Salation. But uh, let's just decode when he's saying he doesn't want to have any man around bothering her. Yeah. He doesn't want her to have sex with anyone but him. That's that's a fact. Yeah. I mean, let's we're giving away the store on this one. But I yeah. mean, no. The, come on. The way he's saying that, the way he's insistent upon, the way that he previously was really kind of gross in the way that he was telling her his daughter he didn't want her dating the other dude. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, I, I'm totally agreeing with you. I'm just like, yeah, it's... I mean, that's it. I, we're just giving away the store, but fuck it. it, it you kind of get it. <laughs> right. Yes, it's gross. Yes, he is a bit obsessed with her, but that's so far all that we've shown. But again, this is a huge red fucking flag that you cannot ignore in a giallo. Yeah. And I really feel like they are waving the red flag in our face as if it is a thong at a strip club. I agree completely. Yes. <laughs> In that it's not very subtle, and I'm at all still very grateful for it. Yeah, right. Thank you. And there have been a few moments of thank you in this movie we missed, but <laughs> I we're mean, Jallo season, so there's always going to be parts of thank yous in this movie. Everyone should know that by right. now. I, I just actually would want to give a blanket thank you overall to the movie. With other than like that one beating, most of the yeah. nudity in this film was like healthy thank you movie nudity moments. Yeah. People having a good time. And if you like to see bits of dudes. Uh, right before the guy actually starts beating her, he hops up in bed yelling at her, and uh, it pops out, and then he grabs the sheet real quick to cover it up. Yeah, you see, you see some caterpillar out there. You oh, do. no, yeah. you don't just see some caterpillar, man. I saw everything. <laughs> oh, motherfucker, you had it on a big screen. Yeah, yeah. And there's a couple of sequences, too, where some of the ladies are rolling around in bed, and uh, the film catches it all, and the transfer shows it on the projection screen. And I saw everything. <laughs> Good guy. Good, good man. Good yeah. job. So just a blanket overall statement for the film. Thank you, movie, for a lot of that stuff, because you really, like, for a giallo, like I said, except for the beating that, that does happen, most of the nudity, if not all of the nudity that's in the film, was pretty healthy for the most part that I remember. And I, I want to comment on that because it was a shocking moment for me Yeah, to realize that. And I think I came to yeah. that realization when the doctor creeped me out. So it's really interesting that we brought it up again here because that's where it hit you. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because the, uh, the the doctor being all pervy and weird on his daughter made me go, oh, oh God, he's going to, no, we're going to see some incestuous rape or something. Because this is a giallo. Something's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and that's what I think made me think of it. And probably you as well. Probably. Yeah, you're not wrong. Okay. So then uh, he gets a call from the judge and the judge needs some files. So that kind of interrupts their convo. Uh, then we see the uh, ex-wife of Antoine. She accuses the girl who was the boyfriend defended uh, earlier at the club. Uh, the ex-wife of Antoine accuses her of sleeping with that guy. That guy owns the club, by the way. Uh, of sleeping with her boyfriend. And she's like, I didn't do anything like that. You know, don't be a fucking ass. Um, or anything like that. Um, then uh, she's like, she's like, I know like my boyfriend, she's like, I know he's been going out a lot. Oh, at all hours of the night and I haven't seen him in uh, uh, like, I, I don't ever get to see him anymore. All that kind of shit. So now there you go. There's another red herring for you. I mean, um, you wouldn't be in a giallo if we didn't have yeah. at least four of them at all times. At this point, we cut to that boyfriend and he's with that girl, Alice, who they talked about before, who was interested in the money. They are talking about said money and they can't wait to get it. So, okay, now what's going on? Sounds like somebody's blackmailing somebody and it may have something to do with the murder that happened at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. So, then um, we see uh, a dude, he meets up with a lady who is the maid of the judge and they start getting it on while the killer is outside of the door. Uh, we see the judge just goes through through some files when he hears a noise. He grabs a gun and he goes looking around, but he finds there's just a window that's open, knocking against the wind, so he closes it. Uh, we're back to two people fucking again. Uh, thanks, movie. Uh, then the <coughs> prosecutor sits, or the judge sits down, goes right through some more files, and the killer slits his throat, and he dies, and that's the end of that 20 minutes before we go into the final third. The throat of slits are not as good as they were in last week's movie trauma yeah. uh, the makeup wise but what it lacks in that it makes up for in the brutality of when they cut wide to the actor with the look on their faces whenever they're being cut 
um, actor yeah. or actress or whoever it is. And some of them just get downright like super fucking brutal. And this may be a one of them because it's just so quick and swift and kind of like like we saw in some of the other Jalos where it's just all of a sudden the hand comes out of the frame, like no warning and slit. And that's kind of how this one works. Yeah, right. Yeah. And that's that. Yeah, just a slit. The, the deaths aren't as brutal as the, yeah, in the last movie. They're exactly right. I think the money went to more actors than it did in the last movie. And one thing that this one definitely uh, seems to have more of is less actors craning their neck to help out their killer. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, none of them crank their neck up just to meet their killer's killing ability. <laughs> <laughs> right. But we're, I mean, I'm not trying to compare them. I'm just, you know, where that was last week's, this is this week's, and they both had razor slashes to throats. So, yes. I mean, that's... although I think from what I see from Jallos, a lot of this is just. Uh, people who are like, fuck it, uh, just slit their throats constantly. That's what we do. Yeah, razor <laughs> slashes and giallos. It's a thing. Yeah, especially. It's, it's a thing. Yeah. It's definitely a thing. Throat slashes I, with I, razors in Italian cinema in general. It's a thing. Yeah. It's definitely a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Slitting the throats, uh, the best way to kill them in, in Italian cinema. <laughs> <laughs> oh man okay the mystery parts of the film are really developing quite well though uh if you're yeah, trying we, to follow the thread and figure it out um there's we have a lot of a uh, lot of suspects yeah and nobody that is more glaring than anybody else really no um, no not really because everyone's everyone's been acting sus in some sort of way right and the people that i said may be blackmailing for all we know they may be doing some kind of a murder plot to get money like two weeks ago's film where it was kill everybody yeah. take all the jewels and walk off Exactly. And then just get the fuck out of there. Yeah. I mean, like, it's uh, a very bizarre kind of way about the film where we don't really know what's going on. We're just seeing the brutal slayings. And so far, it's just everybody that's connected to the night of the original slaying for the prostitute. And some parts of us wonder if it's even revenge, like if the wife is killing these other folks, the ex-wife. Yeah, these are all, all the murders are people who were told they were going to be murdered. There was going to be vengeance rained upon them. Yeah, all of the so. victims, yeah. Uh, are so far and uh, it seems to be coming true and now we're wondering who would perpetrate such a thing and yeah and why like that's the thing that we have to try and figure out yes that is exactly right um all right well the final 30 let's get down into it yeah let's fucking finish this off and figure out who our actual killer is the doctor's daughter wakes up kind of looks like she had a nightmare uh the doctor comes in he's like hey what's 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 wrong everything all right and she's like i had she says she had a dream that you know someone they cared about got really hurt uh or murdered and they're experiencing pain uh just then the doc gets a call about the judge and that the judge is dead um so then we cut to the cop or detective the writer and the doctor and they're all talking in our next clip so why tessa Ye was murdered to make god Wallace's prediction come true then according to that professor there's still peppy and marianne on the list and you randall you're on a list that is if we're to believe the curse of antoine's and the possibility of taking revenge post-mortem I see your point. Inspector Fontaine, there must be a link between these strange murders. They're beyond comprehension. Yes, very difficult to explain it. It's a literary case without precedent. That's why I'm fascinated by it. And the story will make me very famous. It must be a coincidence. The murderer is clever, but he won't escape justice. Well, if I read correctly, I understand that you have two suspects in custody. Morning News said that you've arrested Doris, Tessier's maid, and her lover. Well, he's only an accomplice. He's not strong enough to have done it, you see. It took a man. Yes. Mike. Mike, her lover. Huh. That makes sense. A coincidence, not a curse. Well, gentlemen, I must be on my way. Goodbye. Bye, Professor. Bye. Well, if you don't need me anymore, Inspector, I'll be going. Uh, now. Goodbye. Uh, just a moment. I guess I made a mistake. I thought I saw some scratches. Yeah. Sorry. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, uh, by the way, Randall, I'd like you to come down to headquarters this afternoon. There's a couple of things I'd like to clear up with you. Let's say around four. I think you'll find it very interesting. A uh, your book. Okay. What the fuck? Yeah, so now everyone's thinking 
maybe it's the the judge's maid and her boyfriend. Um, <laughs> so the uh, so then uh, after a while, they question. They release the guy who was there with Margaret, the maid. The the detective releases him and as he leaves. The detective goes, "I just don't think it was him. I think he's clean because you could tell the killer was right handed and this." The homeboy apparently seems to be more left-handed. Um, then the detective calls to speak with the ex-wife of Antoine, but she is not at the club. Well, the cops decide to go looking for her. They bust in on her, uh, on her place there, and they find Alice murdered and the boyfriend murdered. So there go two more suspects. The assistant and the doctor's daughter, uh, they are talking, and she's just trying to make him see that her dad's very old-fashioned and that you know there's a reason why he you know she doesn't want him to catch them and they have a moment where they start kissing and the doctor unfortunately walks in on him and he ain't happy uh kicks the assistant out of the house pretty much says listen you're you're done in this town you'll never work here again uh i'm sure there's worse things he probably could have caught him doing to his daughter than kissing her but hey man uh i guess whatever whatever you gotta do um you completely misunderstand the jealousy that he has no, right yeah, at this I, moment at this moment yeah you're like although it's starting to become more clear as uh, everything goes along <laughs> about what's happening around here. <laughs> Fuck it. Those of us who have um, had a girlfriend whose father was creepy like this at one point in time, they're both dead. It doesn't matter. Uh, okay. <laughs> not because of me, I swear. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> just because I really know how to pick them, Matt. <laughs> you, you, uh, you're doing a bang-up job over there. I in mean, my... you got the end result right, at least. Yeah, yeah, that, mean... that, that's true. Yeah, I, once I learned from my yeah. numerous mistakes in the past. But anyway, there as someone who has actually been in, in a relationship with a girl whose father was this creepy, like in yeah. this kind of way, um, I can totally tell you that at the point where he does the talk about the bothering, it's obvious to me what's going on with the father towards the daughter. Yeah, okay. Uh, but I didn't see that. When he gets super jealous in the way that he's like he is here and how it's inappropriate, he'll never work in this town. It's like he caught the guy kissing his wife is how he's yeah. reacting. Yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah, it seems very heavily like that. So like, the, hmm. way, the way that he is acting is extremely inappropriate, where it's one of those things where it's like it's a guy who refuses to fuck his own wife, but is pissed off that she's going to go for somebody else. That's the kind of indignant he's being about. Yeah, this. yeah, yeah. That's that's a fact. Oh, gross. Um, yeah. Oh, just terrible. Uh, so anyway, uh, then the uh, cops, uh, uh, after all this happens, we cut back to the police station. The cops are talking in our next clip. Did you go through that? Yeah, it's quite interesting. How many girls worked at Madame Collette's? There were five. Kiki. Rosie. Uh, Marlene. Francine, the dead girl Alice, whom we found in Pepe's house. Only five. Why, Inspector? I count six. Randall has written about another. On page 137, he writes about Leonora. I think we better have another talk with Randall. No, Randall was here earlier, but he didn't stay. Picked up Tina and left. It seems the death of Pepe hasn't hurt the business. Say la vie. Marianne, she here? Mm-mm. Haven't seen her tonight. Hey, Martha. Who is? Gotta go to work. Doctor, I'd like to have a word with you. Don't want to talk about anything with you. Well, you can decide to talk here or in my office. Take your choice. Well, Inspector, I propose it here. Were you ever a client of Madame Colette? <laughs> <laughs> Me? You're kidding. You happen to be the only one I know who's been in love with Leonora. What are you talking about? I came here looking for Randall to find out why he mentions her name in his manuscript. I think that there are other Leonoras in the world. I agree. And I'm sure when I talk to Randall, we'll find out that there aren't too many Leonoras. Huh. 
Yeah. Hmm. Well, cut to that writer and Tina. They are making out and they're going at it. And we see somebody's trying to break into the place, like using almost jewelry thieves type stuff, you know, cutting the window and shit like that. Jewelry so, thief or like spy who loved me, you know? Yeah. All that type of stuff. But still. It's sh- extremely intricate tool work for glass cutting that whoever is doing this has. Yes, exactly. Then the uh, somebody comes to the door. And we see it's the ex-wife of Antoine. She comes in and the writer says, you know, I'll excuse me, I'll get a, get us a drink. And sh- that woman talks to Tina. Now we find out this Tina, this was the girl who was getting roughed up, who the ex-wife thought that her her boyfriend was sleeping with. And so she apologizes to her, says she, you know, she found out that it was actually Alice who, you know, the boyfriend was boning and not her. And now he's dead and she doesn't know what she's going to do. And um, the writer comes in. And he's like, hey, you know what? We'll we'll figure stuff out. But uh, you know, I gotta, I gotta, I got something to take care of. And he and Tina go into the room and start, you know, getting ready to bone because they gotta take care of some business. Um. All the while this is kind of going on, we see somebody comes in, takes a sword off the wall. Um, the ex-wife decides she's done. She's going to leave. Um, uh, so as she gets up to leave, she hears something. She walks, and then she gets decapitated by the killer. One so, would assume. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, she, she definitely gets, uh, pretty much beheaded. Uh, anyway, the, uh, writer hears all this. Something's a commotion. He goes out and he sees her beheaded and he freaks. And then beyond this curtain, he gets stabbed through the back into the gut. He walks a bit and he dies. Um, after that, his, uh, Tina, the girl he was hooking up with, she comes out and she's kind of just looking around and she sees the death and mayhem that's, uh, all around her and she's like ew fuck this is bad and so, i think she screams in abject terror more than ew yeah. fuck this is bad yeah yeah and then she gets strangled to death this was a serious sequence of brutality that just kind of hits all at once it was like a spree killing uh the beheading looked pretty fucking fake the first yeah. they all uh, clearly spent all their money on the first beheading yes clearly but this and even that like, didn't look all that good no but like this one, like, the other sculpt was a little bit more believable for his head, I think, than what it is for hers. And I think it's the actress, uh, Rosa Albaneri, I think is how you pronounce her name. Uh, she has such a unique and striking set of features that, like, you just you can't you, you can't copy them. This is basically yeah, what I'm getting at. That's probably for true. For whereas, true. Whereas the actor who was playing our killer at the beginning, or would-be killer, that now we're starting to really think may have been innocent this entire time, because why else would these killings happen? <laughs> <laughs> but not too innocent because he's clearly still a fucking domestic violence kind of guy. Yeah. <laughs> still deserves to get his head chopped off, right? Yes. Yeah. He still deserved to get decapitated. Yeah. Definitely. But, but the amount of time that we spend with decapitated heads and people moving decapitated heads and fucking with decapitated heads in this film is inordinately large for a cello. It really is. Yeah. Unless you're, it's, you're not wrong. Unless it's a killer that collects heads. And if that exists out there, hit your boy up with a title. Yeah. What's that movie about? Let's watch that motherfucker. <laughs> and don't tell me Dario Argento's trauma. I already have that. Yeah. Don't be weird. So anyway, the police come in. They find the scene and it's just all death and destruction. Um, then uh, the, as the cop detective looks around, he sees that um, our writer has drawn the letter M in his own blood. And so now he believes that it might be Martin. He says Martin. And he gets a flashback, though, of the doctor talking about a boyfriend named Mike for uh, for the housemaid and not Martin. So now he's like, maybe there was a second boyfriend. And so he runs up and the cop pays her a visit. She's again getting down with Martin. But she stops and she's like, oh, I'll get Martin. He goes, no, no, no. I want to know about your other boyfriend, Mike. I was told about a Mike. Uh, the doctor told me. And she goes, she says that she only calls him Mike when they are having sex. That's just what she calls him when they have sex. Everyone has a pet name. It's not even weird. Stop kink shaming people. Uh, well, I wasn't even bothering to learn his real name because like yeah. all, all his name matters to me is whenever she's banging him and she can call him whatever the fuck she wants. That's true. Uh, as she explains more, he announced her 
researched and realized that M is a W. Well, we... Didn't we see this when Mr. Burns got shot, Matt? I I think so. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, Just then, the daughter, she comes in to check on her dear old dad, and he has a really fucking rabid look on his face, and she's like, Dad? And he starts trying to, well, have sex with her. He's trying to rape her. And she's like, no, please don't. Luckily, her boyfriend shows in, he runs in, he breaks it up, and that turns into our final clip. A case like you should be considered psychopathological. How would you classify yourself? You depraved, filthy pig. You were jealous of anyone who got near your daughter. And every time you visited Madame Colette's for girls, in reality, they all were Leonora to you. Hold it. I said hold it. A miscalculation, or I'd have been here sooner. This is the end of the line for you, Waldemar. Before dying, Randall managed to write in his own blood the letter M. But it was a W that he wrote to identify you, Waldemar. You and Tessier were Madame Colette's VIP clients. You know where we found this mask? In Judge Tessier's house. I'm sure we'll find the other one. Somewhere in your house. Francine was your first victim. Holy shit. We get a flashback where we see that after Antoine leaves after beating the girl, a hooded figure goes up, and the hooded figure is, of course, the good doctor. He keeps calling her by her da- his daughter's name and saying, are you all right? Are you all right? And she flips and tells him to get away from her. And she's like, no amount of money is going to make me love you or anything. And he flips and kills her. And, you know, so we see that's what begins this whole process. Uh, this it doc- makes her death even more fucking disgusting because after being yeah. beaten by one John this other guy creeps up on her to try and use it as an excuse to make her into his daughter so he can finally fuck his daughter and then when she rejects him and fucking talks down to him and belittles him he beats her to death with a fucking lamp yeah it's yeah, fucking horrific much. Yeah, it's horrific. It's sad. Uh, you know, this poor girl, she's, she didn't, the poor lady didn't deserve any of this kind of shit. And, uh, she's trying to make a living in the world. And she had one ultra possessive, abusive dude. And then one dude who wanted to bone his daughter. So she got the worst of humanity right there in front of her. And again, as I had said earlier, had she been more experienced, she may have been able to talk some of these psychopathic assholes down at least a little bit to where she could get someone to yeah. assist removing them from her life. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem like that was the case. And given how emotional she was after what just happened, of course, what that creepy old fuck tried to pull on her would upset her and have her yelling at him. Yes, um, of course. It's fucking disgusting. And it's very realistic how her death actually happened. It feels like an episode of like true crime. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> or like, like something you'd see on Dateline. Yeah, well, no, no, the, the storyline for the HBO series True Crime, where like they uncover the murder and this is oh. how it turns okay. out like well, it's always it also so seems like it'd be real enough to be a dateline <laughs> yeah yeah like where you f- you hear about this where like it turns out you know dna reveals that the murderer all along was this guy yeah yeah exactly and then you find out that like you know years later he tried to rape his own daughter because he's fucked up you know oh, jesus because he finally just fucking lost his shit he couldn't control himself anymore it's yeah uh, when this movie lays this stuff on you it makes all the stuff that you watched earlier in the film have an even more sinister t- Tone, so a rewatch of this is going to be even more dark yeah for sure once this gets laid on you because it just like it just throws it at you and it's like oh and by the way and you're like holy fuck because now you got to think about it the next time you watch it yeah exactly you're like, Ugh. god damn it can't just be a murder mystery now it's all this shit too <laughs> well that's how giallo works they got to throw something like that in and it backloaded the back half of this movie with all of this giallo stuff i know we're almost there so let's just finish it off and then we'll, we'll dig in even further but this big reveal and then this flashback that shows you what really happened after he left after beating her with the the death and the murder and how this triggered the whole thing and the way they just kind of unwind it all at you at once you do kind of have to stop and talk about it because holy fuck it's everything at once and how all these other people now besides her are all dead because Antoine made the the 
the death threat. So instead of when the uh, judge was going to reopen the files, he was like, oh, I got to kill everyone associated now because that's what Anton said he would do and make everyone think it was the curse. <laughs> right. And also that way he's covering up what it is that he did because once the judge really starts looking into it, he's going to be more sus. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, the doctor does run away. There's a manhunt. A chase ensues. And then we kind of cut back to what we saw at the beginning of the movie. He climbs the Eiffel Tower. They follow him. He falls off and dies. We see he had Antoine's eyeball with him or at least some eyeball with him i don't know whose i do know that tina the girl who was strangled uh you know with the writer and the ex-wife she had her eyes removed so that's not good um yeah it's either hers or originally anton's but for whatever reason carrying eyeballs he gets an eyeball with him yeah and uh roll credits This ticks so many boxes of just making sure that it covers various aspects of things that show up in Giallo that this is unarguably a Giallo to me. This is definitely a Giallo, yeah. As far as Giallo January goes, this might be the most Giallo Giallo that we've had this January. It might be the most Giallo of the Giallos we had. And I thought beating last week's was going to be hard. <laughs> Beating what last week? Be- beat, uh, beating beating the movie last week was oh be hard oh yeah Jolly. being more jolly than last week's movie yeah yeah I could kind of see that because yeah it was a horrible Hitchcock ripoff that turned out to be quite an endearing film that leaves you not able to stop thinking about it uh, yeah this is absolutely one hundred percent unarguably the most jolly that we've had so far uh, it goes into every direction that you were kind of expecting it to go thankfully uh, we have no complete sexual assaults or nor sexual assaults that are dwelt upon like we saw in last week's film um so that definitely was a bonus however the creepy dad trying to rape his daughter definitely covered the and woman abuser and not just you know physically abusive but also like he views women as his property um yeah and also plying plying with goods to trade for the person that he viewed as his property yeah 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 Yeah, they're not just they're not a person there and that shows that he only believes that they're only there you know not as a person to enrich themselves but just to enrich him unfortunately that's the way that a lot of men view women as if uh they are an extension of their watch or suit that they are wearing as an accessory you are correct and uh those guys they fucking assholes <laughs> no one is arguing that point the perverse characters the obsessive male character that we have in this one that that does frequent in gialli that that would be prone to violence for those types of outbursts and outrages and things uh this weird like sex cult thing going on that's involved with the brothel that's clearly like folks in the town that are just being whisked away back and forth because you know they're they're allowed to be kept secret because they're prominent figures uh, yeah. like that is there and then kind of ignored as far as the threat goes where not even the investigators look into that all that much you know but then yeah. it turns out that it was fucking one of them and it makes sense whenever the film reveals a you know goes back and shows you what really happened you know <laughs> in the room after the guy fled yeah yeah right yeah jesus christ it was it, and, you know and usually that kind of cheat bugs me because i hate when we get like a piece of information that's been hidden this whole time that we don't get but in fact, the way that they made it appear, because this happened later on in the same room, this is the kind of cheat that works for me where it's like, hey, you didn't have this information because nobody investigating this at any point had this information until now. You know, yeah. th- that that this is how we confirm who the killer was, but the killer was there afterwards. And while the guy is a woman beating piece of shit who ended up getting put on trial for this, he was not the actual one who killed her, you know? So yeah. the way that they did that is, is actually like one of the ploys that I like in a mystery when they're giving me information that I did not have but like telling me that you know like oh I did you know I got this file from uh, this you know place sent over just from you know another country like they'll do sometimes in Agatha Christie with Perot where all of a sudden he has information just handed to him and he just like ah that confirms my suspicion the entire time and he goes in this huge diatribe and you're like you're like okay well that file came from fucking nowhere so like of course I can't fucking figure it out from that (laughs) how was I supposed to know you had all the info and it shared any of it with me right and being a fan of mysteries means that you constantly butt up against something like that at all times and I gotta say, what you and I have been doing with the Giallos is where we're actually focusing in on the mystery part of it and seeing how the mystery functions, like we started doing before even we did this Giallo January, like that is my favorite way that we're covering it. And I gotta say, the mystery in this holds up, kept my intrigue, and while I was suspecting the 
the doctor the entire time because he was making me cringy. I had no other means or anything like that to go on. And I kept thinking like, well, the other people that I thought it was going to be don't seem to have as much motivation as this guy's creeping me out. And I was going, yeah, I was going, so I didn't solve it or figure it out because the mystery was telling, like I was following up on the clues. I solved it from my gut intuition on how the guy creeps me out and it's a Gialli. But at the same time, when they finally develop it into a murder mystery to show me the the how, the why, and the when, and all of that kind of stuff, I didn't I didn't feel cheated that it no. was just because I figured it out because he creeped me out. I, I felt vindicated where I was like, I knew there was something wrong with that motherfucker. I was, I was down to the doc and his or his assistant. It was gonna be one of those two. Yeah, and I was like less thinking it was the assistant because the more the doc was around, the more you started seeing him be gross towards his daughter and yeah. possessive of his daughter. So the only reason I. I ever suspected his assistant was because he was being sus about the assistant. And as soon as I figured out that he was being sus because he was jealous of the fact that the assistant was getting with his daughter, then I realized it was like, oh, so that assistant is probably fine. Yeah, and right. I yeah. totally stopped suspecting him in any way, shape, or form. Lots of dropped threads usually in Gialli's, right? I do not think that this film really dropped a lot. I don't think so either. Like maybe a couple things, but nothing that I can really sticks out at me. Yeah. And the reason I kept highlighting about the doctor is because the film did a pretty decent job of underplaying it up until about the time when he talks about the bothering and then it becomes real obvious. Yeah. I think it plays its hand there, which is why I kind of became more forceful about it. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. the other thing I got to kind of commend this specific jelly for is once again, the sexual situations for the most part seem to be very consensual and very healthy. Obviously, the rape scene was not one of them. And then, like, excluding the beating, even the nudity was all something that you could kind of be grateful to be able to see because it was in healthy, consensual situations for the most part. Granted, those consensual situations may be involving a transaction of a pay-to-play nature, but I am completely all for that, okay with it, and in support of it, so long as everybody's safe and washes their hands afterwards. Yeah, right. Everyone just make sure you wash up. Goddamn. <laughs> yeah. And, and as I, I think you'll kind of back me up on this too. The would-be sexual assault that's going to happen with a daughter is grotesque in the fact that the implication of it is grotesque. It never gets graphic enough before it is completely stopped, thankfully. Yes. Yeah, no, that is very true. So for a Gialli, you would say that that is very merciful in that 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 side of it. So I mean, this one would probably be one that I would have people check out if they were as sensitive to that kind of thing on film as what you and I can be, you know? Yeah, agreed yeah. on that one. Yeah. Big time. Man, we're three for fucking three. For Giallo yeah, January, right? Really good. Good shit. Yeah. Nothing bad at all. And look at that. We got done fucking talking about it in time that we could do the news unless you got something else you want to say. No, man. Let's do some news. All right. Fuck it. Let's move on. We're going to take a little break here. We're going to have. Oh, uh, boy. I'm, uh, I, uh, uh. So the murder ballots that I, I chose, um, I'm kind of regretting the second one because I thought we would talk too much and we wouldn't get to the news. And I have no justification. I'm sorry. <laughs> Guns and Roses with uh, Used to Love Her. And uh, like I said, I'm kind of regretting some of the choices that I've made here on the Pirate Radio Edit. Because after discussing the film and it being um, kind of misogynistic and grotesque as some of the actions were in the film, uh, it's amplified that much more after discussing it by playing Used to Love Her by Guns N' Roses. It's a, it's a bit on the nose, too, for the actual movie. Just saying. <laughs> well, that was my thing. I wanted to be on the nose with it because I like being on the nose with the references. But like, this is a bit much even for me like i'm yeah i'm shocked and outraged at myself in that i am not going to change it in any way shape or form <laughs> <laughs> but let's just stop discussing this fucking cock rock anthem and let's get some news. The 
this from Dan? Was Beasel the last name on that? Yeah. Oh, he's a podcaster, so it's Beasel. All right, it's from Beasel. <laughs> Dan uh, Beasel. Yes. It's from the bees. Um, <laughs> man poops on child's picnic table, then steals her scooter on Christmas. <laughs> oh my God, you had to fucking pick that one. Duh. It has some pee all over the place, but I cleaned it up. I don't know what they got a problem with. <laughs> this is Aurora, Colorado. Uh, a family woke up to a disturbing surprise on Christmas morning. Feces scattered on their child's picnic table, and her scooter gone. The mother who wishes the mother who wishes to remain anonymous said that she saw what happened after watching the Ring surveillance video. I'm telling you, whoever created like Ring, all that stuff, they should get a Nobel Peace Prize. I'm gonna tell you why. Because I have entertained myself for hours on youtube like on <laughs> ring footage of people either falling uh drunk and saying something doing stupid shit uh i once saw a child uh like completely and utterly dress down their parent during a halloween where the child was taking one candy from a bowl that was set out and the the mom wanted him to take the full bowl and the kid literally and he, the ring picks it up dresses the fucking mom down to the point where she's like fine let's just go it's the fucking greatest thing i've ever seen it's it's the the ring things whoever created it again is a genius i think that's going um, to the spank bank <laughs> weird response uh, bro yeah right uh, hey, bro, I can't she states it up. that her girls were laying in bed way past bedtime, waiting to hear Santa and his reindeer land on the roof. Then the five-year-old went outside the next morning and saw it. She instantly told me not to worry. It had been uh, it had been the reindeer that pooped. It had to have been one of the reindeer that pooped outside. My wow, asshole good. actually sweat. <laughs> that's that's gonna. You know what? Not now, but in about ten years, that's gonna be real funny. Uh, the, the, that family's gonna have a real story. And earn your rectal passage. Ooh, or uh, accident. Yeah, right. Uh, the mother said that the, they wished that she was right, but unfortunately, they had a nasty mess to clean up. In the video, the man is seen walking up to the family's porch, looking around, then dropping his pants to defecate on the picnic table. Fuck, I want that footage. <laughs> That's just probably the funniest fucking thing. Matt's the man, new thing is naughty ring videos. That's what he yeah, likes to masturbate to. I mean, no, the, the, the ring videos are for my laughing. If I want to masturbate, I need uh, uh, backdoor videos. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you decide what I mean by that. So anyway. <laughs> oh, I know what you mean by that. And it's still <laughs> ring video footage. It's just around the back of the house a, while someone's being a, backdoored. It's a, It's a different ring. Uh, so the man, you blow out the o ring. The man moves around a few times before pulling up his pants, looking around, and then he spotted grabbing the scooter and riding away. I like to think the guy's looking around before he poop, like a dog, like just circles around. Like, I think this is the best spot for me. I just don't understand people who can just like poop and then not have to wipe. Like, I just, yeah, right? Like, like I don't know how you go about your like life after that. It would just bother me to no end. <laughs> right. Like, even if you're out in the woods fucking hunting, you got to work something out, like with some fucking leaves or some shit because you just can't leave that behind. You're going to regret it. Yeah, I just would feel so unclean. It's so dirty. It's not a matter of unclean. The shit starts to fucking itch after a while if you leave well, it in yeah, there, Yeah, but that's... I mean, that's part of it. Yeah, I'm saying it's all part of it. Yeah, it's fucking gross and you never, you can't not think about it. Like, that's the part. I love how we're, we're focusing in on this and not about this fucking psychopath who takes a shit on somebody's fucking picnic table and steals on, a on child's scooter. a little scooter. kid's picnic table. So it's not even, you know, it's not even like an adult picnic table. He literally took a shit at a kid's picnic table. And we don't know why yet, so let's go back. <laughs> we don't know. All right. So anyway, someone has to, she hopes that someone will recognize him, and they just want to know, they just want him to know how horrible that was, and they hope he is so embarrassed, and that he'll never do it again. Listen, um, ma'am, if a person's at the point in their life where on Christmas Eve, they are outside, and they are generally taking shits, and the one place where they find a shit isn't even in the yard. It's on a obvious little kid's picnic table. The, um... The embarrassment, as you put it, they don't feel that feeling. That feeling isn't there. There's no shame. There's no embarrassment anymore. That's not there. They have they have left and they have graduated into another level that you don't know. It's ma'am, you don't know this level, and I, we hope you never find out because you never want to get to this level. But they're at the shitting in random backyards in mysterious places level at life, and there's no such thing as embarrassment here. There's no more fucking shame or embarrassment that he 
To him, he's living his best life. Now, he needs help, but I'm just telling you what the score is. This guy, he <laughs> probably read this news story, and he laughed his balls off, all right? And then he did whatever substance he did that made him shit in that backyard of that kid's table, only to go out and find a weirder place to take a shit. Yeah, that guy is like Nick Sachs from Happy Level of Fucked, to be able yeah. to just wander up onto somebody's porch and take a shit on a kid's fucking picnic table. I thought this was a vindictive thing. Like, I thought there was a reason for it. Is that the end yeah the end yeah that is pretty much the end the only end is a neighbor found the scooter down the street and returned it so they didn't catch the guy i'm don't think it's a vindictive thing i think this is a gentleman who has uh for lack of a better term you might say is almost at rock bottom and uh he's he's living his life in that sense he is at the level of i get fucked up never mind he's at the level where he gets fucked up (laughs) and he will shit on people's picnic table tables and in weird places and then steal an item to try to make an escape before he gets down to the end of the street and realizes you know a kid's scooter is the worst fucking way to try to make a getaway and probably his asshole was itchy so it was time to go home <laughs> yeah this guy is in a different level of fucking dark like he's living in the sweet spot as we like to call it here at cinema yeah. that yeah. that place where you haven't hit rock bottom enough to really stop enough to regret all of the choices that you've made yet you totally are also not going to stop because you're going to continue doing whatever destructive behavior you're living in. That's yeah. pretty much the sweet spot. <laughs> that is that is right where he's at. Like, so yeah, I'm just like, I hope he's embarrassed. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe someday, years down the road, if he lives and he gets goes through like some sort of cleanup and sobriety, yeah, he might be embarrassed. Definitely. Definitely he'll feel it then. Yeah, when he's in a 12-step program and he is yeah. talking about the things that he has done, he's yeah. going to tell the story about how when he was fucked up. At he his used lowest to t- point. Yeah, <laughs> not even at his lowest point. Like, but, he's like but we. I hope this is his lowest point. Maybe this is what causes him to get help, but, but he's like, when I was near the lowest. <laughs> yeah, if this is not your lowest... Taking a shit on a kid's picnic table on somebody's porch on uh, Christmas way, Eve is yeah, not Christmas your lowest. Eve point in colorado uh you know i want to know what the tip was that night because you think it, you'd be shit icicles at that point right like, like if if that is not your low point i i do not want to know what your low point actually is because that would be my low point it would imagine i would imagine it would be like he's pushing out like fudgicles that have been left in the back of the freezer for like six months well that's uh entirely disgusting and the point at which i'm going to end the show on so good night everybody here's the ending legion promo if you enjoyed the show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shadecast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.
locked me in. That's Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds from the album Murder Ballads. He did an entire album of Murder Ballads. This song featuring PJ Harvey, so that amazing female vocal, PJ Harvey, for those of you listening on the Pirate Radio edit there. Nice. Yeah. enjoyable. Yeah, uh, really a great album. Uh, Nick Cave is an artist that I continue to just sort of rediscover various moments of his career that I didn't even know that I wasn't aware of. And uh, Murder Ballads happens to be an album where I just kind of dismissed it when I was a youth because I was an asshole. And as I've grown as a man and started to appreciate other styles of music a bit more, I really appreciate that album. And I think you would dig it too because they're all fucking Murder Ballads. I mean, that's what the album is called because that's what it is. Nothing wrong with murder ballads. <laughs> if you would like to find the other instances where it sure sounds like I'm trying to sell you something because of how enthusiastic I get about shit on this show, the best place to find that, all previous 335 instances of me doing that, legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops dash podcast. Just let him be excited, people. He's not trying to sell you anything. He's... He's excited. Be nice to him. I have so little joy in my life that when I actually find something that I can recognize gives me hope and or joy, I fixate on it. It's a mental health issue. I'm working on it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course. If you'd like to find something that I do purposely to try to bring more joy into the world, well, the best place to find that is our Instagram, cinema underscore psyops, where I try to share a meme thrice daily to make you laugh. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, all the memes are out there just for you people to laugh at. He's not trying to sell you anything. So if you see Snicker Bars memes, that's just a coincidence. Snickers isn't paying us. <laughs> Jesus, I wish I could get that kind of fucking money. Fuck. Right? I mean, oh, shit. That'd I mean, nice. I'm not saying I wouldn't fucking sell out. If you would like to fucking have me sell out, you could tweet at me about how to fucking sell out at court underscore psy up there. You want me to fucking sell shit? That's fine. Just give me the fucking money. Give me all the fucking money. The fucking world's over with anyway, so I might as well take all the fucking money. Yeah, man. In a couple of weeks, fucking everything's going to pop off. So fuck it. Why not? Let's get some money. In the meantime, you can hunker down in our Facebook group with your fellow folks that seem to be noticing that the world's turning to shit out there. It's Cinema PsyOps on Facebook, and Facebook is probably directly responsible for things turning to shit out there. And I, I mean, it court PsyOps it, on Facebook. It definitely didn't help. No, if anything, it stoked the fucking fire. It was like gasoline and shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, social media. I don't know what's more at fault, Facebook or Twitter. Well, one thing that you definitely can't blame is email, right, Matt? I'm sure no. email is perfectly okay. And you can email feedback to me, cinemasyopscourt at gmail.com, where you can tell me all the things that you have to say about how social media is destroying the world, much like my co-host, very spiritorial theory rant. You know, just say it. Fuck it. Well, while you're out there pissed off that we didn't do the NFT news that I promised you last week, kick the fuck out of this week and make it your bit. Go ahead, start recording on your side. And I am now recording. One, two, three. All right, I'm downloading the clips right now. Not as many uh, empty spots with just um, subtitles as I thought. I guess that was just from what it said. It was the most complete version, which makes sense. But like, yeah. But like the parts that were inserted were just like additional pieces to a sentence. And it just feels like the uh, English language dub, they were just trying to tighten up the editing, is all that it was. Could have been, yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, the clips are all downloaded. Let me open the files and copy it over here real quick. <sighs> so Mac has this, like Apple computers, they have this really stupid thing that they do where the favorites bar that they allow to the left, you yeah. you put a fucking folder in there and you can't drag stuff over to copy it to that folder in that favorites bar. It doesn't recognize it. That is stupid. But there's a the thing is like, if I click on it, if I do like a cut and paste, like if I do a, you know, control Apple command or whatever they fucking call it, it's stupid, but I just call it control because it's all the fucking same. I know what button I have to hit. Yeah. <laughs> but like the, you know, the control C, control V, control X, control V, that works if I click on it, uh-huh. which I think they're all about their key commands with Apple, but it's just a weird thing that they won't let so you just weird. drag it over. You think that they would let you because that is so user friendly. I could do that shit with my fucking iPhone on the same panel. Yeah. That's just stupid. <laughs> and you know me, I ain't down with Mac. Me and Max, we ain't down with, with none of that. We don't, I don't, I don't play that shit. <laughs> You'll get them secured on a network if someone you work for has to have them. Otherwise, yes. fuck off with that shit. That's, that's pretty much exactly what my life is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm gonna have to abandon ship on trying to get the network the way that I want it because I'm too much of a pleb and I may have to have you come over and uh, help me set up that fucking router. All right, that's fine. <laughs> I bricked the fucking thing and brought it back from the dead three times with trying to change their settings. Something's not right. Motherfucker, Jesus Christ. <laughs> what are you fucking doing over there? <laughs> Mad science, bitch. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure Dr. Frankenstein didn't reboot the monster six different fucking times. <laughs> Be a different movie, though. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be kind of interesting, actually, a rebootable yeah, yeah, monster. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Trademark. Like, trademark. Uh, trademark. Trademark. Okay. Like, oh, shit. He killed another little girl by the water. All right. Reboot him. We'll load up some other protocols. Well, that seems to be what Universal Studios thinks they can do with their monster franchises. Just keep rebooting it and trying another monster verse, but they fail miserably every time. It's what the WB thinks they can do with DC. <laughs> <laughs> Which is Warner Brothers in general. The actual WB uh, network or yeah. CW or whatever the fuck it is now, yeah. they're actually doing it right. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, when I say WB, I'm, yeah, I meant Warner Brothers for the movies. <laughs> okay, you did watch French Sex Murder, so we can do the fucking show. Yes. All right, let's fucking yeah. do the show then. <laughs> All right, all right. Don't we, be sexist. Females right. can murder too. But in the French sexist mur- or fre- French sex murders, that was a nice Freudian slit slot. Yeah, slot. yeah, no. What the hell are you doing? I've completely lost what I was even going to say. Now I can't even. In the remember. French sex giallo genre. You dig? I dig. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? I'm the one with the pipes better to suit it to do that. True. Well, I, I I could have good pipes, but if I did it as loud as I could, the neighbors would definitely call the police. Also, there would be a really, really serious Richter scale event on yeah. Omaha because of your booming <laughs> fucking yeah, voice. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I have to watch that shit. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, because, uh, yeah, your voice, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> it goes it goes for a while. <laughs> Sometimes we don't even have to plug in your mic. We've made that joke like a billion times. Can we just move on and do the show we, now? We can come, move come, the come, fuck come. on. Hey, just, real quick. I didn't see you. Yeah. There was a point where uh, I checked, and I'm like, hey, uh, my waveform ain't going. I had the wrong microphone pick, and I had I said it right, so now it's right. Okay, so at the very beginning, we'll have to do very Skype. very beginning up. for like the first like 10 minutes, maybe. Okay. It's that. Ah. Uh, that's fine, and I'll throw that in later. So we'll, right. just, we'll go into the song. So three, two, one. So, uh, and then, uh, oh, sorry. It's okay. You were on a roll and then just kind of fizzled out. <laughs> uh, um, of course, this had to happen to me. Uh, let's see here. Ba, ba, ba. Okay. Get up the guy. Uh, he accuses her of sleeping with Hello? the boyfriend. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Matt, are you back? I'm here. Hello? 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 Hey, I lost you there. So you yeah. s- she got accused of something when the boyfriend left the club. Did you finish off that thought on your notes? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I, I could hear you the whole time. Don't know oh. what happened there. Okay, well, just um, pick up where you left off then because I'm good now. Right. Three, two, one. And don't tell me Dario Argento's trauma. I already have that. Yeah, don't be weird. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes your reactions to that where you're trying to like bounce off are a little disproportionate. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, you're like, yeah, yeah some movie one. I don't know the title of. Comment. Yeah, you dicks. <laughs> <laughs> don't be so accosting to our audience. They love us enough to listen every fucking week. We owe them at least a little gratitude for it.
pissed off that we didn't do the nft news that i promised you last week kick the fuck out of this week and make it your bitch oh yeah i totally forgot about that good one <laughs> all right we got i'm gonna put a note in <laughs> remember nft news <laughs> you still recording i have finished recording now